This week on Rockstar Superhero. Burial Waves is doing new things with old sounds. I spoke to Ross Hurt today, and as expected, he was an interesting cat. The band's guitarist and resident cinephile, Ross is doing his very best to capture something real and simple, at the same time hiding textures and complexities inside the very music we think is simple, until it explodes, capturing us in its supernova. I really love their new EP, Holy Ground, and I expect you might be curious about it after this really cool interview, so take a listen to the show, then jump over to their Bandcamp page and support this great new amalgam of musicians. This is a band made of other bands, and it's as epic as you might think. So, please enjoy this super fun chat with my movie-loving brother, Ross Hurt, from Burial Waves, on the Rockstar Superhero Podcast. The thing I noted about you um, is your playing style is 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 really special. There's a there's a uniqueness to the tone and the style, um, and I'm really I mean I I, I don't want to exaggerate here, but I like the word awe because I love I'm in awe of that approach in sound, and I think it's mm. because it's unheard of these days, hmm. right? Nowadays we get these really dense guitar tones. Everything is overdriven. Everything mm. is reamped. Everything is super loud in a mix. Yeah. And and you guys have this really sort of, I mean, I don't know if I'd call it old fashioned, but you have this really old school approach to tones on this new record. Mm. And again, this is coming from a drummer myself that does not play guitar, but you know, I spent 25 years behind <laughs> great players you know i know yeah. good sounds man and you have them in spades so congrats thanks. on it man oh yeah. thank you thank you uh yeah it's it's a combination it's 50 percent masking lack of talent <laughs> with, with a bunch of effects and uh <laughs> and then 50 percent just kind of like a obsessive compulsive disorder when it comes to uh sound i mean yeah. the, the the tonal imprint of every instrument from bass to guitar to everything across the board i i i uh and kyle's the same way with vocals but for the guitars and for the bass i'm very much uh as, as focused as possible with that sort of thing yeah that's cool so so then this leads me to believe that you are the producer of the work uh yeah producer is kind of a, a weird word a yeah. producer like um i i second guess myself i've like crippling imposter syndrome and and i Don't like to, yeah i like to turn a lot of it over and consistently ask everyone like does that sound good does that does that sound okay is this is this the right thing um in terms of constructing the songs formats of the songs a lot of times i'll send out an idea where it's a, a kernel of an idea like 25 percent. it's like here's an intro here's the part a part b part c let me know what you think and i'll dig in if you guys feel it but if not then i'll abandon ship and throw those in the riff bank yeah but for for tone and for stacking of effects and stuff like that uh, it's um most of it's my rig my equipment um from the the base rig is the base rig i use for uh the old band black clouds oh, okay um and then when I jumped over to guitar, I kind of had a general idea of what I want. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not super big into thick, heavy, crazy distortion stuff. I like yeah. that to be the base. Yeah. And I, I just kind of want a lot of texture, a lot of layers. And uh, having Matt on second guitar filled that out in a lot of ways. So there, yeah. there, there is a ton of insane saturation fuzz out layers overdriven guitar stuff they usually run parallel with each other as opposed to series mm -hmm. and this is i'm, I'm already getting super nerdy right no this is great i love this <laughs> my people my people love this too it's good okay, <laughs> okay. keep going so, so a lot a lot of matt stuff is um when he's really leaning into it it's um a lot of fuzz running parallel with a kind of light transparent overdrive stuff 
And it just gives it this really nasty, gross, um, intense stuff. And that's really when he's kind of lining up with the bass and syncing up with the bass. I, I, I like to look at it as the bass is locked in with the drums. It's it's very much the the Black Clouds was kind of um Young Widows bass and drums yeah. and Brian Eno on guitars. Yes. And and I I've taken some of that sort of stuff, but I, I like a little more dynamics on guitars. Uh-huh. So there's there's a little more riffiness and a little less floatiness. Um, but I've learned that the secret for having some of that cut through is any of my stuff, uh, the high up textural stuff is there's barely any gain, barely a distortion. Fuzz is so sparingly on it. Yeah. And whenever Matt gets into that region, his he really backs off the fuzz, backs off the gain and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it, it's rare that we fill in that middle gap because that's where I want Kyle to go nuts. Yeah. Now, I, this is so rad that you're saying these things because it totally it totally fleshes out what I'm hearing too as a listener, right? On the outside, mm-hmm. I'm hearing this and I'm saying there's a lot of spareness. There's a lot of space. I mean, there's a lot going on, Ross. I mean, obviously, you know, mm-hmm. you take you take a- any one of these five tracks and there's a lot going on. Yeah. But, five dudes. <laughs> right. But but they right, but they but it feeds it feeds itself really well, if this makes sense. It's it's you know, the songs are morsel after morsel after morsel they're they're meals right they're not just like a big mm. steak or a big loud salad right i know i'm sure. being a little silly right now but it's 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 very much late 80s early 90s uh proto punk uh, as far as i'm not talking your sound but but the but the 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 production aspect of it, the way you're considering the tones and mm. you're you're giving them clarity, you're not just muddling them all in the middle. And if you listen, as I did on headphones, it's very separated. So you really hear things going on, and it's exciting. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean it's that that so much of that is a testament to Paul Malinowski's work. Uh, he he mixed it. And he plays bass in Shiner. Shiner is one of my favorite bands of all time. And it, uh, oddly enough, what, when we, when you were talking about reservation, more or less, and kind of the the gaps in there, I, I would be fooling myself if I didn't pretend that that band in particular, mainly Josh Newton's stuff, is such a heavy influence on it. Um, him and I talk all the time just about gear and movies and shit like cool. that. But cool, cool, cool. Uh, but one of the main things I, I heard him talking with Alan Epley, you know, a couple of years ago at this point in time. And Alan was talking about when, she, when Josh first joined Shiner and the, the, he kind of felt like he was right for the job because Alan would look over and be like, what's he playing right there? And he would look over and see Josh just wasn't playing anything. It's like, uh-huh. are you going to do anything? And Josh is like, no, I don't think he needs it right here. I think we got enough going on and I'll, I'll come in with something when I yeah. feel like I need to come in with something. And I, I do that. I've found that I did that a lot with black clouds, but I do it even more with uh burial waves. I, mm-hmm. I will sit and listen. Sometimes I'll write out full orchestration shit. Kyle will come in with a vocal line and I'll just be like, okay, I'm, I'm just not going to play here wow. uh, because it doesn't service the song. And yeah. I think Kyle brings so much of that with his, melodies and lines that I, I'm able to kind of take a backseat. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You talk about cinema a lot too, because even like the names of your songs, right? Cinema shame. Mm-hmm. <laughs> your music is cinematic. I mean, one of the first things I thought, I mean, again, we'll get there, but we might as well a little, you know, talk about a little right now since we're there, which sure. is when I heard lightheads, mm. it literally sounded like music. Now, now just hear me out here. <laughs> I imagined a crime scene. Now, I'm not talking police and all these things. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about just post murder or post robbery or post something where oh. the where the criminal is walking around in the room cleaning up after himself to make sure there's no evidence left behind. Lightheads sounded like music over the top of a scene like that because there's this combat, there's this dichotomy, right? There's there's a darkness to it. There's this soulful lightness to it. There's this punkish ni- ni- nihilism or nihilism, however you pronounce the word, I've never known, mm-hmm. <laughs> to the tones. Nihilist, but, Donnie. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> but, the, but the song 
feels, and I want to use the word quotes, it feels like it's what you guys are trying to create. That there's a feeling to the song. It sounds a certain way that 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 is evocative. It makes me think. It, it visualizes things very well for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure I'm not in the right arena, but you know, what were you thinking about when you guys wrote that? No, I, th- I think you're tapping into um, something. I, I, I never imagine like a crime scene sort of thing, but mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm a very visual person. Mm-hmm. I am obsessed with film uh, entirely, uh, unhealthy obsession with movies and um, some shows. Uh, but when uh, when I write, I, I don't think... I, I'm I'm a, a very mainstream listener. I love a lot of pop stuff. I love a lot of the traditional rock and roll music stuff. And I love listening to that. And I've never been able to write like that. I have I can write like that, but I've I've always hated it. I've always been like, ah, oh, this sucks. This sounds like I'm trying to sound like Tom Petty or sure. you know, whomever. But if I um kind of do my own thing i find that i i write more in movements Mm -hmm. and i'll have the start and i'll have the ending and then whatever happens in between it could be one part it could be two parts it could be you know in the in in terms of a song like the guest i I think the the working title of that song was just parts 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 because it's Mm -hmm. like 15 different parts that just all seem to flow into each other pretty well um and a lot of that comes from a writing practice that Justin and I would do in black clouds where we would be in the practice space and put, put a TV in there and play movies like the fountain play movies like uh, the mist or anything of the sorts and just kind of have the volume down and try and take swings at live scoring it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sort of stuff. And that wouldn't be the whole song, but it would give us a motif. It would give us a part that we could hang on to and build around from there. Yeah. And, and I do a lot of that with uh, burial wave stuff and lightheads in particular. That um, that drone at the very beginning very much came from that. That that came from me taking a ripping a YouTube clip and being like, I'm just going to score this as just kind of a test sort nice. of thing. And and it came from that, and then it sort of just built from there. Um, and I like the soft textural score stuff of guys like Johan Johansson. Uh, when he was around, uh, obviously Brian, you know, Nick Cave Warren mm-hmm. Ellis is a huge uh, one for me. And um, having that sort of soft touch with really crashing and crushing dynamics coming from the bass and the drums in particular is something that mm. speaks to me. And, and wow. just it helps me flow into it. It seems like it spoke to Kyle when w- we were getting this going. It's definitely something Jimmy and I seem to get along great with (laughs) yeah yeah it makes a lot of sense i mean what you're saying what i've heard it all connects the dots for me right and for anybody who's listening you know when you pick up this record because i'm pretty much commanded you to go pick up this record (laughs) is is you're going to hear that same familiarity right there's there's something in there that again i want to use the word evocative because it does create an atmosphere that you've heard or that you or that you think you've heard Mm -hmm. but it does it in a new and unique way. And that's what I love about it. Um, Are you familiar with the band Limb Lifter or maybe Age of Electric? They're two mid-90s Canadian sort of pop punk power pop bands. Um, I'm I'm not super familiar. The name Limb Lifter rings a bell, but I have not taken a dive into anyone's catalogs. Okay. Well, I, re- I mentioned these because these are these bands are precursors to the new pornographers um, and then Todd Kern's work as he jumped off with Slash. Um, when I heard this initially, I was reminded of of Ryan's work in Limb Lifter. I'm a huge Limb Lifter fan. And, okay. and I think it's because there's this playful darkness to both your styles, but here you are telling me how much movies affect and and you know have in a sense formed you probably more influential to you than than any band right is, is that kind of correct uh no i mean i i think i definitely pull from a lot of stuff it's funny you mentioned new pornographers that's i think that's how i have heard of limb, limb lifter, lifter. Yeah, yeah yeah in particular uh i'm friends with blaine uh who just recently left new pornographers and yeah. 
uh, him and I would always talk about film scores whenever we would cross paths. Yeah. Uh, he's, he is a filmmaker now, like full time. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So that's yeah. why he left. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a, he has a feature, um, called, uh, man, kicking, kicking blood, kicking the blood okay. or something okay. like that. That's okay. coming out. It just premiered at Toronto international film festival, but okay. he's got a couple credits under his belt. Um, and he's done a number of the new pornographers videos and stuff like that. But, okay. um, I, I love new pornographers, even yeah. though that is like very much ELO, cheap yeah. trick sort yeah, of yeah. stuff yeah absolutely I, I, yeah I, I love them i've been a fan for you know 15 plus years uh just kind of really obsessive fan of their music and um no i i, I pull from a lot of different things what i think for burial waves in particular um the the soundtrack template thing was just that was the that was the starting ground that was the kind of for me uh doing guitar stuff was uh, the starting ground and gotcha. the, ori the the original demos and shit that I would send out were way too Jonesy and Alex or Sigaros like sort of stuff where I would send it out and Kyle's like yeah man I'm, I'm just I'm not hearing it like, I, I don't <laughs> it's quite too know. spacey dude <laughs> yeah and like Jimmy would be like I don't know what I'm supposed to play here but then I would just kind of be like oh no this is where it comes in crushing right. and right. so much of that stuff I mean there are chord progressions. I play bass very much like I would play guitar uh, with chord progressions in mind. And right. um, so much of that uh, stuff, the, the particularly anything that's remotely melancholy that has any sort of pop tendencies, I would either pull directly from uh, Amy Mann. Who oh, I, thank God. Yeah, I'm uh, obsessed with Amy Mann. Yeah, she's, in, the, she's incredible. Yeah, incredible. Amazing bassist, just incredible songwriter. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there's so many progressions that I hear in her music when I would transcribe some of her stuff and just sit there and try and figure it out on guitar. I would be like, man, I really like the way that chord flows into that chord and stuff yeah. like that. And then other ones, uh, Chavez was like such a huge one for me on this. Cool. And um, it was kind of, uh, talking with Clay from Chavez. Uh, he was talking about going from La Volta to Chavez where he's like, yeah, it was kind of weird because the goal was to almost de-learn guitar yeah and he's like that was a lot harder <laughs> than, uh, than it sounds to de-learn stuff and growing up listening to fugazi and everything like that with those really sort of dissonant guitars and um you know dudes that famously have really no idea what they're doing as far as notes as far as uh you know uh, being able to name the chords or anything like that right right yeah it, it yeah. was hard to go from Playing with uh, playing with a guy like Justin in Black Clouds, who's very much a theory guy, who uh, will throw out terms where I'm like, oh, okay, I, yeah. I haven't heard that since college. <laughs> um, to trying to go the Chavez route of just like, why does this sound like this? And it doesn't make sense, but for some reason, it just feels right and it just sounds good. And sticking with that stuff, I, combining all of that stuff, just is, uh, you know. You, you you add a bunch of shit to your tool belt and then you just start kind of pulling it off when you need yeah. it, how you need it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so interesting that you're saying all these things, Ross, because it reminds me actually of the mindset of Stevic from 12 Foot Ninja. Are you familiar with 12 Foot Ninja? I'm not. But I'm writing literally every one of these down that you're talking. okay. You gotta you gotta check out you gotta check out Twelve Foot Ninja. Now a lot of people do not take them seriously. They think they're a joke band, right? Okay. Uh, and that's not the case at all. They just have a very very intense sense of humor. Mm -hmm. But they are monster monster musicians. And what the guitarist did, the, the main songwriter, his name is Stevic, um, is he went to work with um, a guitar company, and I'm gonna totally mess this up because because this is not my jam. This is not what I'm talking about right now. But sure. he invented a guitar um, called the Shuriken, which is af named after a Japanese throwing star. Sure. And it's okay. capable. So it's like a MIDI control device, right? Okay. But it's not MIDI. It's something else. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it uses line six as its pass through. And everybody's clouding over right now. I could just hear it. Uh, but but basically, it allows you to completely change the tuning at any given time of the guitar to turn okay. off strings, you name it, right? So you can literally just be like, you know, what, E, G, B, whatever. Sure. And, and, there's, and then the bottom three strings are muted. Yeah, I think, uh, 
I think Dustin from Thrice was using something there you similar go. to that. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think so. And so the point being is you can have, and he has a song, um, which I can't remember the name of at the moment, but they have this material that's a cross between Latin and metal. Hmm. And they, I mean, real Latin as in like sambas and merengues, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden it drops into the heaviest breakdown you've ever heard. And it all done on the same guitar, all right within a millisecond, because, well, it's designed to do that, right? And I think yeah. one song has 56 different changes with tunings and 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 sounds going from a you know a strat to a Les Paul, it, et cetera, et cetera. So that rules. I mean, if the technology is there, then if the technology is there, use it. You yeah. know? Yeah. If 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 that's what you hear in your head, uh, there's so many people that will say, Oh, well, that's kind of cheating or something like that. It's like, dude, you want the guy to have 50 guitars on tour yeah, yeah. and like and have five to six guitar changes per song? Come on. Like and tuning for 20 seconds after each song. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's just yeah. It, if it if it fits the needs, then just do it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's very cool. I, I, yeah. I, I can't wait to check this out. Yeah. Oh, you'll I think I mean I, I don't know if you'll love it, but I think you'll appreciate it, right? If that makes sense. There, there's a I there's a lot of stuff out there that's like that for me. There is. <laughs> um, so let me ask you some simple questions about yourself before we jump into the band. Um, yeah. Are you personally from D.C. or Baltimore or just that general area? The general area. I mean, born in Virginia, grew up in Maryland, lived in D.C. Uh, for pretty much the past 10 years. Wow. Uh, okay. Just moved back to Maryland uh, okay. to, because we, we had a, another kid and we needed more space. Uh, and you can't afford anything in DC. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, DC area, DC metro area. Um, gotcha. I, I w I'm not a DC native, but I'm a probably DC scene mm. native. Mm. I guess you mm. could say. Um, yeah. That was kind of my upbringing. Yeah. I ask because upbringings like that, especially when you have those rural versus right urban areas that are so wildly different right yeah. that's a very diverse area there's mm. extreme wealth extreme poverty especially like in say northeast baltimore sure and and i'm wondering how much of that forms a musician you know forms your personal identity or maybe the musical core behind the band i for me looking at it at this point in time in my life it it's just gas money uh because it just means that now i have to go to baltimore to see the good shows because yeah i think when i was coming up and really kind of becoming a person that would go to shows and stuff like that we're talking the 90s for the most part mm -hmm. uh fugazi was still active yeah uh bands like uh jawbox were kind of winding down bands like burning airlines were coming up and there there was a scene that people could connect with q and not you was around uh it, there were still bands that were doing this handshake discord um you know ian mckay mentality and ethic system uh, yeah. of just like this is for the music uh, yeah, yeah. sort of thing and you could get by you could live in neighborhoods like shaw or you could live in uh you know woodley park or anything like that and off of a touring musician's income yeah those days are so long gone yes um and i mean you look at the 930 club where what it was in 1997 versus what it is now it is uh you know going to rodeo drive <laughs> you yeah. know yeah. um so it, it, it's just very different and um all of that stuff i mean the, the you know the, the affordable housing and everything like that is out in baltimore now and yeah. I, I think that that's why the scene is so vibrant there and kind of stale in DC. And that's, I'm not saying that there's no DC bands. There are DC bands, but right. I don't think the, the community and the scene is what it was when I was there. And uh, yeah, I mean, Matt from Barrow Waves lives in Baltimore. Kyle lives in Baltimore. Uh, Kevin lives way out in Virginia. Wow. Uh, Jimmy now lives in Ocean City, Maryland. And I'm just on the cusp of DC. Wow. Uh, that has to make it difficult, though. I mean, I mean, I get it. We live in a world where everybody can, you know, record and mix at home and and email tracks, and mm -hmm. and that's all great. But doesn't that affect um, the the traditional old school vibe of of coming up together and figuring out your sound together, playing in a room together? Yeah. Um, I mean, so Kevin and I, we have been playing music together since, man fifth grade 
something wow. like that. That's rad. Um, on and off, you know, and um, you know, th- there's different dynamics for different projects. And I sure. think that the when when we were in seventh grade together, we would say, okay, Saturday's practice day, and we'd meet up at like noon, and we would practice until seven p.m. Oh. None of us really have the <laughs> time. <laughs> stamina or anything of the sorts to do that now. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy and I were in a band, you know, this is, we're talking 10 years ago, where that was kind of the model where it was Sundays, we would start at 10 a.m. and we would go until 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, this is before families, other commitments and stuff like that come into play. Yeah. Now, all of us have those commitments, uh, yeah. whether you're a business owner, uh, you know, father or just, you know, married or anything, you have obligations that you know, I hate to use the word Trump, but they it's they, hard. They, they Trump to uh, the band practice, you mm-hmm, know. Mm-hmm, and I think mm-hmm. that all of us kind of know the goals of the band realistically, and um, we're not trying to quote unquote make it uh, because I think that that idea and concept is just whatever. So it's yeah. very much a it's an us thing, and we treat it like, hey, remember, like we're supposed to play golf. The, this yeah. this week at this course or whatever, yeah. and uh, when we show up to practice, it, it it very much is that. So that does require a little bit more effort and direction from an individual that's bringing a track to the band, where it's just like, hey, so here's the idea, here's how you play it, and stuff like that, as opposed to let's sit on this and jam on this for a while, because um, mm. I think time is a little bit more precious uh, yeah. for collectively as opposed to individually. Yeah, I mean, it's proof of wisdom and time and age. I mean, it's just the way things are. We yeah. don't have a choice. Things change. Some things leave us behind, or we can leave things behind. Mm-hmm. But but it's that binary option. That's it. Yeah, and I think so much of that um, gets jettisoned in to practice like subconsciously because of how we've all operated as a band in terms of recording. Yeah. You know, the, we're, we've net, with the exception of Kyle, we've never, none of us have really operated on a label level where we have to pay X amount per day for this. We go in and we're like, we have so much shit we have to get done within this small window of time. Let's make the most of it. So we're pretty proficient in terms of how we capitalize the time together and stuff like yeah. that. So I, th- I think that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, it goes back to the wisdom, though, uh, and the experience, right? I mean, you can't have wisdom without experience. And now you know, yeah, we're limited to this. We have to move. This is the way it is. We have to be professionals because we have to we have to go back to our families and give them the time they deserve. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, You know, it's interesting, too, because Ross Valerie from Journey about 11 years ago, I remember he said something that was just really profound. Some guy was talking to him and said, you know, Ross, what's it like? being you know in this you know hugely famous you know mega band for the last 40 years and he said i'll trade you huh yeah. interesting okay. and now of course it interesting you know interestingly was he not was talking about band. like trying to unload his uh publishing or something like that <laughs> i yeah i think yeah maybe but i guess what i'm trying to say is is he just didn't want to be he didn't you know it's not that he didn't want to be in journey anymore he mm-hmm. just never got to be like us he never got to get married and have family and and stay home and do a normal job. He was always in pursuit of the rock and you know the rock star dream. Oh, for sure, yeah. And it's you know it's a trade off. You you take one or take the other. I don't know. I mean, I I think about it all the time. But you know, I'd probably be dead if I were still out there. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I um, it, it 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 is a it is a way of life. It is a commitment to something. It is. You're yeah. married to your band in yeah. that case, and exactly. um, I, I think that the tenure and the longevity of like all of any band that I shouldn't say that there, there there's a couple a lot. bands yeah there there are a couple bands that like are in the second third fourth decade of their careers that still get along famously, mm-hmm. uh, but then they're 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 you know. Some kind of monster exists, you know. <laughs> that, <laughs> hint, 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 hint. Yeah, that document <laughs> that documentary is out there, and uh, it's yeah. relatable not just because it's unintentionally hilarious. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know, it, it with any creative thing, with anything that you're pouring passion into, there's going to be difficult times. I mean, you know, but yeah. I th- I think that when the expectation, like what we have right now with Barrel Waves, is is just kind of 
really chill. Every time I die is a great example. They're they're 25 years into it, and they are um their mindset is the second this stops being fun, or the second that we're not stoked on what we're doing, then we're done. Right. And I right. think that's a great thing that that pushes you to, that challenges you enough as a creator, as a writer, to say, let's do this and let's do this. Uh, but also kind of um you know, keeps keeps it realistic because you know there's no sense in dragging a dead horse on onto the stage every time you go on. That that would suck. I would yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. And I would imagine you know, not that I know anything about the inner workings of Journey, but I would imagine that is kind of like that. It's more of a business at this point in time than it is a oh, yeah. creative endeavor for those guys. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, I mean, yeah. They're just they're just really working in service to what they've already created. They're yeah, certainly the not moving band. forward. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. is fine. I mean, God bless those guys, man. It's awesome. I'm Have at it, I'm, uh, man. Like when I actually get bummed when I saw police do their reunion. When was that? Like 2005. Yeah. And Stuart Copeland's just kind of mouthing off as as oh, he would always do. Yeah. Um, the worst. It, yeah, it's just like, dude, you get to you get to be a legacy band playing these songs that like are beloved by millions that like, obviously you love, you could just fucking live in the nostalgia of that whole thing yes. and earn millions in the process. Yeah. But you would rather just kind of kick up settled dirt. I don't know. Well, but, but you know, the malcontent lifestyle is, you know, not only is it not desirable to somebody like yourself or myself, but mm -hmm. to that person, they can't help themselves. I mean, Don Henley's famous for it. They're just some, <laughs> they're just some people who can't stop poking the beehive. I mean, Stuart, I, I no wonder the band broke up. Jeez, we could blame <laughs> we could we could blame Sting all day for having an ego. No, Stuart is an awful. I mean, that man. I mean, he's a great musician. Don't get me wrong. Phenomenal but, drummer, like but, huge inspiration on drums. But but my God, I could not imagine even wanting to be in that room. Like I have no desire to ever interview him because dude, I have no it would desire piss me off. Yeah, I have no desire to really surround myself with people that feel obligated to give so much unsolicited advice. Yes, it's, or, or just like unsolicited <laughs> opinions. It's just like he just yeah. will mouth off on shit where it's like, dude, uh, okay, nobody like, asked. Yeah. Can't, I'm, does that mean I'm not allowed to enjoy this? I, so I'm not allowed to like REM because you have like critiques about the guitar playing? Well, okay, then don't fucking listen to them. Who cares? <laughs> exactly. But yeah. like you said, some people can't help themselves. Some people can't. Uh, let's talk about the new Burial Waves album, right? Okay. Holy, holy ground, man. Holy ground. Yeah. Uh, the album releases next friday so we're recording this what uh november 3rd so mm -hmm. what november 12th november 12th correct okay yeah. okay yeah so just getting down to it what are you hearing from somebody like myself you know critics fans you know how are the people responding to what they've heard so far and and what are your feelings about the the whole album um so like like i mentioned at the top i i do have crazy imposter syndrome we've, mm -hmm. we've sat on these songs for quite a while. Uh, we didn't really have a solid plan on putting anything out because so much of this was recorded during the pandemic. We we're like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe we should just put out a song here, a song there. And then when we get around to doing an LP or a full length, we'll do that. And, and just like looking at how the landscape changed where, you know, it was like, okay, the, well, if we record these, 10 songs by this point in time, we could have vinyl out by that. Well, that's not going to happen. We're not going to see vinyl for <laughs> two, three years at this point in time. Right. right. So we're kind of just like, well, let's, let's, there's, there might be a light at the end of the tunnel. If enough people are getting vaccinated that we could start playing out, maybe we could do like a run of shows here or there. Let's put something out. Let's put this EP out. Um, at this point in time, like all, so many of those songs, I've heard them over and over and over again. I'm kind of like, are these still good? I have no idea. And then as far as listening to critics, reading reviews or anything like that, I, I honestly, I stopped doing that uh, so long ago. Hmm. I, um, I, I, I will listen to peers if I um, send them a mix before it's mastered or anything like, hey, what do you sure. think of this or something sure, like sure, that? Sure, sure. Um, but for the most part, I, I don't really pay attention to um a lot of the reviews like if if, if pitchfork 
reviewed it, I'd probably know what the number is, but I'm right. not going to, I'm not going to read into it. Uh, right. Right. Well, I mean, everybody's got an opinion, but uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious what the maybe sort of general feedback is. I mean, even, even if the critics, the, even if the audience, it doesn't matter, right? Nobody mm -hmm. really knows what is good. You know what you think is good based on what you like, based on your lens. That's it. It's just that simple, right? Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, they're, they're, man, Donnie Darko is good though. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking epic! <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah, I mean, so so this is kind of my like lame, probably too much in my head take on it. Okay. I would imagine that so many people that take the time to write a review that are not coming from it from a fan perspective might be someone that is just sitting at their desk shooting rubber bands up at the ceiling and then their editor comes in and says, hey, I need you to write a review on this. Yeah, it's yeah. like, when do you need it by? We're living in a time where putting out content is the most important thing. So yeah. I don't think, that, I think that some so many people might get it, have the... 22 because it's an ep you know have the 22 minutes or so that it takes to listen to it and then we'll write three paragraphs on it give it to their editor get it back proofread it you know go through it again and then put it out there for me i'm not going to i think brian cook puts this very well i'm not if if it doesn't speak to me i'm not going to write a review on anything um if there's a movie that doesn't hit me in a way i'm not going to uh try and remotely wax poetic on it or anything of the sorts. And, um, you know, when I do podcast stuff, I'm, I get, I'm sure you get tons of PR emails from mm -hmm. people where it's like, Hey, can you interview this person or this yeah. person or this and person? The answer is most of the time is no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, a lot of times I just like don't have time to respond, but yeah. I'm not going to really reach out or try and do something unless I have a, you know, admiration or connection. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times in terms of, feedback that might hit me in a way is hearing from a musician that I genuinely look up to and love saying, yo, this shit, this shit's really good. That, yeah. that would mean everything to me hearing yeah. from, uh, and it's as simple as like someone like Paul, when he's mixing it, mm -hmm. when I, we're sending notes back and forth and he might give me a call and he's just like, Hey, so yeah, I was revisiting this, uh, reopen the session to tweak the stuff that you asked me to. And he's like, man, it's been a minute and I forgot this stuff kind of rips. That's, yeah. that's all I need. That's the validation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't need to read uh, the thoughts of someone that may have been asked to do this, that didn't really want to. Yeah. Who, who knows what they were going through that day? Something like yeah. that. That being said, I have gotten requests from people that, um, you know, I don't, I don't want an echo chamber where it's just like, oh, oh, I only want fans to review our stuff. But yeah. um, I think people, that if it's unprompted, unsolicited, where it's just a friend of a friend of a friend or someone that like knows pianos become the teeth or new black clouds or anything of the sorts, it's like, oh, I, I really wanted to hear this. And they're kind of saying like, I'm disappointed because it didn't deliver these yeah. expectations or... Yeah. These blew away my expectations. That is something I'll I'll kind of go in with, but yeah, uh, and and appreciate more. I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean that, that's a that's a great answer. I mean, we're very similar in that because I mean, certainly the same goes for here, right? I mean, I, I can't interview everybody. I have an opportunity mm -hmm. to one. Right. I don't one. I don't want to because a lot of it I just simply don't like. And I mean, and I have a wide. Uh, diverse taste and and again based on the mo movie styles that we shared before we started recording it's the same idea i mean we we both i think are listening we're trying a lot of different things but you have to kind of love something to want to spend this time together and yeah the, again going back to what i said earlier there's something about what you guys have created the you know the magic the secret ingredient whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. there's something in this, right? I mean, Cinema Shame, you know, was the title of one of your tunes. Um, it's actually the first song I heard, and I think it's probably the one you've probably hoped people will hear first. Okay. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, so, I mean, there's there's a lot of popular influence in there, right? What we talked about before. And yet, again, it sounds uniquely Burial Wave, but it it spoke to me. And, and going back to what I said a second ago about feeling it, I felt it, you know, um, 
I'm wondering though, as an artist, if there's a part of you that when you get a positive response from somebody like me, do you say, oh yeah, well, let me fuck with your mind on this one, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like uh, the idea of, of, of really kind of poo-pooing a positive statement about the material because not so much that you don't think people get it, but because I think most artists kind of like to upset the balance of things, right? They're looking to provoke and not just create. What's your, what's your thought on that? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that like, I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm not super great with praise in general. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, not, not to brag about being modest, <laughs> but like, I, I'm, I'm a pretty <laughs> modest person, you know, I, um, sure. Tell me how modest I am. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm just. I'm. I'm kind of uncomfortable with uh, a lot of compliments because I. So much of the stuff that I do, um, you know, I you hear all these stories about the the hardship and the labor that goes into certain works of art, and I'm mm -hmm. just like, I I haven't. I never suffered that much to put this stuff through. This is just how I hear stuff, and this right. is what feels right to me. But. I don't think it's uh, an, an intensely laborious process. I'm not trying to be flippant about any of that stuff. I'm just, I, for me, it's just if I'm doing any sort of writing, like uh, comedic writing or anything like that, and someone is being very complimentary, I, it's just weird to me because it, it's, I don't know, it, it, it's just hard for me to, um, I've been around enough people that love talking about themselves to the point where I'm just like, God, like, I, can we talk about the weather? Can we talk about yeah. something else besides yourself, like yeah. and your accomplishments? That I think it like kind of had an adverse effect on me, where I just I'm not comfortable really talking about how good I am at this or how good I am at this. That being said, I I know what I'm good at. I know um, tonally, like you were we were talking about guitar tone and bass tone and stuff like that. I I know what I'm good at in that regards. Uh, when someone's like, "Yo, that that bass tone sounds crushing," I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> here's how it's done. And I, 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 I would love to share that information. Yeah. Um, but as far as like the, the secret sauce to anyone that someone might say, man, this is so great and stuff like that. I'm like, well, let's, let's break it down. Here's, here's, here's why this sounds like this. And here's why this sounds like this. And I kind of distill it to its most simplest form. <laughs> to, a lot of times just kind of showing the people how the sausage is made to where they're kind of just like, Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's yeah. kind of lame, you know? Yeah. Well, so, but like, they're not going to make it themselves, though. You see, they can poo-poo it because they don't necessarily mm -hmm. know how it works. And I'm sorry for interrupting you. But but, but the bottom line is, is you can show them how to make the sausage, but they're not going to go make the sausages themselves. What, what, all right. So, yeah, exactly. So, prime example is uh, Steph Carpenter from Deftones has been posting all these videos of him playing mm -hmm. uh, songs, mainly from Around the Fur online. And there's even been some from like some of the most recent efforts that he's been posting. And I would watch, um, I watch every one yeah. because I, I think he's Pretty just awesome. such a fascinating guitarist. But they have, the, you hear a Deftones song, it's like, like 311. I don't like 311. But if I'm 10 seconds into a 311 song, I'm like, that's 311. Yeah, yeah, you know. That's, that's something special. Like that's that same with Mastodon. It's like you're five seconds into a Mastodon song, you know it's Mastodon, mm -hmm. and because they have a signature sound, Deftones have that. Mm -hmm. So of course I'm going to obsess over how this dude plays. And I'm watching some of these like tutorials. I'm like, oh wow, he's like just kind of moving his index finger around and just one note in it at a time, just going right. from here to here. That's right. crazy how simple that is. Yeah, and yeah. um, you know, learning that stuff made me appreciate the less is more approach that we're talking about the reservation and stuff like that. Like, you know, I, I would listen to a lot of Sparta, um, their, their wiretap scars album. I love that album. I would listen to a lot of that awesome. and, and, awesome. and break it down and be like, Oh man, this is actually like pretty simple. And this yeah. is pretty much just letting the delay do a lot of the work or the baseline is really just kind of three notes, but man, it just, it works. Yeah. So I, 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 I have no problem copying that stuff and it, it feels weird um, to kind of, if anyone wants to throw praise my way, I'm just like, I mean, I'm just kind of playing two notes. 
<laughs> well, yeah, but you know, but 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 I mean, I say this it's because I understand. Yeah, 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 it is how you play them. And and the thing is, is musicians tend to devalue the very thing that makes them exceptional. So I, I guess my my question would be like, you're a drummer, and and yeah. I'm, I'm I'm a drummer as well. Yeah. Do you think that like the drummer for ACDC like accepts tons of praise that might get thrown his way when he is literally the um the most template. basic well that, i mean he's he is but he isn't but like every sound guy or every sound engineer when you go into the studio or when you get up on stage and you set up your kit the guy's like all right kick all right snare rack floor and it's like all right play the whole kit and then if you start doing something busy they're like no 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 just give me give me like yeah, yeah. dc beats or something like right. that right i wonder how that like is that a compliment or is that a, a a a knock against the ACDC drummer who is whose name I don't know to it's be Phil like, Rudd? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think Rudd. yeah, I think Phil Rudd would say thank you, but okay. but I think most people do sort of unintentionally knock it, right? I don't think they're 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 knocking it in the sense of saying yeah, do something stupid because it sucks, right? Sure. But just yeah. but just keep it simple, stupid, right? Right, right, right. and and. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, it takes all kinds. We know this. I mean, that's the beauty of art is, is, you know, you can look at a Jackson Pollock and say, I don't understand why splashed paint on a canvas is worth $10 million, right? right? I, I don't understand that. And then you can look or you listen to Debussy and you can say, I don't understand why romantic music makes so many people happy because it's not dissonant and it doesn't challenge me. Uh, right, Shostakovich would disagree with right, you. but right, but but you get my right, but but you get my point, right? Yeah, is is totally. that there's always somebody saying something about something somewhere, mm. and and it's because we can't undo ourselves. We, I mean, all of us. The nature. That's what I love about music and art is that it's it's completely individual. Everybody's a solo artist. When you get down to it, your band is five solo artists who have figured out a way to be a band. Right. But that, but but everybody's got a different perspective. My unique POV comes from the fact that I grew up in this little town and moved 37 times in my life before I was 40 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. So so my sort of drumming persona is based around my need, my absolute need to be heard, loved, admired, be told I'm special, all the things. And I've spent my entire life being loud and obnoxious, walking into rooms, basically saying, here I am. Because I'm actually desperate inside. So oh, what sure. so what happens is that that need gets translated onto the drums, and then I have to layer my own part in there. And I'm not gonna do a Stuart Copeland, but I'm gonna do something that says, <laughs> here I am. But it has to match up with if I play with Ross, right? Or if I play with this other guy I know who's fantastic, bring them together. It has to it has to become cohesive, or then we have to choose not to be together. But if right. we but if we create something cohesive that's uniquely ours and it will never be thumbprinted again, nothing will ever sound like us three. Half the world, at least half the world, is going to think it sucks. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, for, like <laughs> it's it, just so it, weird for me. It, it's the it, it, it like you're like you're saying it's it's the whole over the part. Yeah. And the band has to be bigger than any name or individual yeah, in yeah. the band. Yeah. And that's crucial. But I think in terms of like what you're saying, in terms of feedback, the, the feedback that matters to me is, um, I guess it, it's kind of threefold. Do my parents not like it? Cool. All right. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a great the starting point. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's checking the first box. Um, yeah. <laughs> number two, um, are, are, are people clapping after a song? That's all I need. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that's the criticism that matters. And then it's more like uh, how I, I probably dive into this stuff way too much and, and dissect this stuff way too much. Being asked to do that, like we did at the top of the episode where I'm breaking down single chain. That yeah. is, that's like to be asked to do that means, okay, I guess I'm doing it right. Because yeah. when I, you know, again, to go back to film, I'm obsessed with not so much the press junket interviews where they're sitting down with the director and then throwing praises at them. You could see the director kind of being like, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Oh, and here's, here's the log line. Here's the pitch and everything that I've told the other 50 reporters I met with today. Mm -hmm. I like this stuff like the DVD commentary or, uh, you know, um, I think Vanity Fair does it a lot. Uh, Esquire probably does it as well, where they're, they're taking someone like Denis Villeneuve who just did Dune. And it's like, break down this scene for us. 
Yeah. And he'll break down the entire scene. Like, this is why I made this decision. This is why I made this decision. And this is why the camera moves this way and so on and so forth. And I think to be asked, how did you do this? How did you do this? How did you do this? From someone that has a genuine interest in it is more important to me as a uh, response than, um, you know, this, this spoke to me in this way, or, you know, as you said, this painted this picture in my head. I love that stuff. I, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled that it, it it's impacted in that way. But once the song is out there, it is, it is the listeners to do with what they want, respond to it, how they want. I detach myself from that entire process. But if mm-hmm. I'm asked and invited to discuss it, that is the biggest compliment I can ever, ever get ever. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm hugely, I mean, I, I don't even know if I know the right word. I'm really honored that you've been here today because I I wanted to talk to you very much and I really do enjoy the music and I don't just enjoy Thanks. it from the sense of, you know, your promo director sent it to me and I liked it. <laughs> I liked it enough to talk to you today. And then as soon as I get off the phone, I'm going to delete the album. You know what I mean? It's, it's not that, but I know there's guys out there doing that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, no, I'm genuinely honored. And I, you know, I, I, I just want I to say that. This. I, I listened to a couple of your previous episodes and, and I genuinely appreciate that. I, I, uh, I always butcher the name Yaucha. Oh, um, I love Yaucha. Oh yeah. my God. I, I listened to that one in particular <laughs> and um, such a fantastic conversation. So I, being, seeing your post yesterday and, and knowing uh, the sincerity that comes behind every one of these episodes and stuff like that and, and being a drummer myself and, and, uh, the you know, understanding your perspective, your vast knowledge of uh, <laughs> bands and everything like that. Like I think you mentioned um, when you were talking about uh, to um, Yaucha, you were you were saying uh, like, oh, it's kind of like this band. They're like Clutch, but they have this. It's just like I like guys that are able to string Aww. the thoughts and the influences along to um, you know find common ground. So Aww. like. That that is that's awesome, and so oh. I'm thrilled to to be <laughs> wow. asked to be part of this conversation. That, that, was, well, that was huge. I was just here asking the basics today, Ross, but I <laughs> I really think you guys are special, and you know I know in this day and age people aren't touring anymore. Nobody releases albums, and like you said, everybody releases singles, and that's it. Mm-hmm. I just I just really honor you because what you're doing is is outside the norm. Um, you're refusing to play ball in the traditional way. You're keeping it real. You're being honest with yourself and you're being honest with your bandmates and, and with me. So that's all we could ask for. Um, before I let you go though, I want to make one recommendation and I want you to give us one recommendation since you're a big, you're big movie guy. Mm -hmm. If there's one movie you had to, that you, you wanted to tell me right now that I had to watch, you know, as soon as I had an opportunity. What would it be? Something that's available streaming right now that I can watch. Okay. Uh, th- there's two. So I'll, I'll, I'll plant one that you could watch immediately and then one that I think should be streaming within two or three weeks. Um, okay. And <clears throat> uh, they're both very relevant to, I think, what we're talking about. Right. And the first one is Pig, which oh, is... Uh, Nick Cage. Yes. And that I went into that expecting a John Wick uh, Nick Cage doing John Wick sort of thing, and mm-hmm. it is not. And uh, working in food and beverage for two decades of my life, I had just an even greater appreciation for that movie. But it really is a testament to what it means to pour your heart into something, and uh, and in the most literal sense, get beaten down um, by uh, you know the other people around you. Um, but you you keep getting up and you keep doing it because you genuinely love it. And you mm-hmm. could spot the imposters, you could spot the phonies and stuff like that. There, there's so much, there's so many layers to that movie. Um, and there's there's so many little things. Am I, I I'm trying to impress this person because I feel like this is important when it's really not. Like I'm I'm not listening to classical music. I'm listening to someone tell me how to listen to classical music. Yes. You're doing it wrong, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, like uh, everything about that movie, just it, it really moved me. I loved it. And the other one I actually just saw yesterday, and um, it's Edgar Wright's new movie. It's Last Night in Soho, and it, it is a wonderful kind of study on the dangers of getting too obsessed with nostalgia. Mm. Um, but more importantly, for me, like we talked so much about imposter syndrome, like that's so much of that the 
there's kind of two parts of that movie. There's the first half, which is, uh, um, you know, kind of psychological study. And then there's the second half, which plays more into like almost like a traditional horror, um, really? psychological thriller sort of stuff. But the, the first half in particular, there's a moment where the protagonist, the main character, um, incredible performance by Thomas and McKenzie is mm -hmm. she's in fashion school and the teacher says like, uh, you know, what, would you do this? And she's like, I really wanted this person to wear the dress. I didn't want the dress to wear her. Um, but she's also suffering from these dreams where she sees her dreams, but she also sees more and more herself, not in those dreams. And uh, the more, the deeper things go, I'm not going to ruin anything. Is that the Anya Taylor-Joy character? Uh, Without giving anything away? You, you just got to kind of see it. Um, okay, okay, okay. Because I, I can kind of sense where you're going with this based on mm -hmm. that she's in the movie, right? Like my brain goes, okay, I can imagine this sort of a facade, this mental facade of creating a, a persona and a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, uh, I, I'm not going to dive into okay, it. Okay, you, okay, you okay. just got to kind of see it. But there, I'll, there's I'll a, watch it. a lot of, of like a lot of fantastic mirror work okay. in, in that movie, which is, I mean, I could watch that movie a thousand times and still have no idea how to do it. It's like what, when you watch a magician over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. it's just like, well, where, where are, where's the hidden compartment? Where are the strings? Like it, it's a sleight of hand masterpiece by Edgar Wright. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think like in terms of the anxiety and um, like pressure that it is to deliver, on certain things to meet these dreams that you have put upon yourself. I, th I mm -hmm. think that it, that kind of horror in itself was uh, resonated with me. Oh my so gosh. those, those two movies uh, th are probably two of my, in my top three of the year for me. Wow. So far. You and I are going to be best friends, dude. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Holy crap. Do we have a lot to talk about? Can I share, <laughs> can I share two movies that I love? Please. Yeah. Okay. So before I let you go here, um, 1999 classic, in my opinion, and completely sadly underseen mm -hmm. is the Limey with Terrence Stamp. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Tell him I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. And yeah. I, oh my God. I love that movie so much. I can't stand it. And nobody seems to know about it except mm -hmm. guys like you who yeah. are movie you know, cinephiles, right? Um, but the latest movie that I have absolutely fallen in love with and I've seen four times now is called The Vast of Night. Oh, uh, the UFO. The um, UFO ra movie. Radio. Except um, it's not a UFO movie. Right, right. It's it's more have about the broadcast. It? Yeah, I loved it. Um, uh, it the Man, there it, is one shot where they're the kind shot. of a, yeah, man. Into the, yeah, it, I mean, I mean, it goes like all the way through the town and then up into the building and then down outside the building and then across yeah. to the, I mean, I mean, and, and usually stuff like that is so, you know, so look at me, right? It's so mm -hmm. self-referential that it's impossible to get out of it, but it creates such atmosphere. And the fact that they picked this town and used all natural light to yeah. film everything you really feel like you're stuck in a in a question mark right it's just is it a nightmare is it a you know is is this a horror scenario is this a ufo is this a military thing and oh, there's yeah. so much open ended it's so freaking good well, i love I, it I'll, so much i'll say that that um the phone call yes. the, first, the 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 when they're kind of hearing the stories mm -hmm. to be that clung like like to like it's not even eyes glued to the it's screen so good it's really just that what you're hearing is such a testament to that guy's storytelling ability yes um as a, as a writer to be able to just like completely suck you into this like this guy's story about like this appearance and stuff like that yeah i i loved that movie my wife really 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 loved that movie yeah and uh made so much more than i did that it made me go back and rewatch it and i had an even higher appreciation for it uh, yeah, yeah 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 well I, and then that scene to, to cap it that scene when the camera uh, when they actually go to black in the yeah. movie mm -hmm. and so you're a radio listener all of a sudden yes um, and i, I think that that stuff conceit. is yeah that when when directors are intentionally able to uh, you know let you know what you're seeing like you know dune again you, you're so much of it is you're you get to see a lot of it from 
Paul Atreides perspective, like his point of view and stuff like right. that. Right. But there's, um, uh, Justin, uh, man, Benson and Moorhead. Yeah, that's their names. Benson and Moorhead. They did like the endless, um, resolution and stuff like that. They've been doing a lot of cool stuff with the camera in terms of flipping the perspective around to be like, no, you are the audience and mm -hmm. you are the audience like in this capacity and this is what we want and this is us not actually in character of the movie this is us being the filmmakers in the movie like it's just it's really cool i i i then the vast night in particular is one that really made me uh when when a filmmaker has you question what you're supposed to be doing as the audience i think they're doing something really good yeah 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 well that is an excellent capstone so let's just say we're good Cool. Um, thank you so much for making the time today. This was super, super cool of you. I really love what Burial Waves is doing. Thank um, you, man. I hope you guys can figure out as a collective to but whatever happens, I hope you and I will stay in touch, Ross, because you're, yeah. you're, you're, a, you're a special guy, man. Really I, I appreciate that. Cool. And yeah, I'm sure that, um, yeah, once, yeah, once there's, there's more kind of a, the, the light at the end of the tunnel gets a little bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, hopefully that'll be spring, maybe summer, who knows, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely be out and about uh, mm -hmm. hit the road and we'll definitely have more stuff uh, in the pipeline as good, well. Good. So. Well, I don't know if you'll ever come to Seattle, but that being said, I can sure find my way out there. So I'm sure we'll connect somehow. So nice. My, uh, I was just in Seattle. Oh, okay. August uh, well, to, to go see these arms of snakes uh, when they. Oh did my their, god! Their okay, yeah. okay. Well, where where about in Seattle? I actually live out east, so I live in Snoqualmie, where they filmed Twin Peaks. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. that that's yeah. a that talking about visuals. That, yes. that is yes. such a huge influence, yes. uh, part, particular on Jimmy and I. That was yeah. like half a Black Clouds catalog was good. L obsessing about Twin Peaks. Good, good. So when you come back, mm -hmm. I'll actually show you around because I know all the places. And, awesome. And, and I can get us inside of a lot of stuff that you can't get in because I'm friends with all the owners. So oh, it's all nice. good. Okay. All right. I heard they got damn good pie out there. They have some pretty, <laughs> pretty decent pie. There you go. <laughs>